As you can tell by my voice, my family is dealing with sickness. And that's why my wife and my uh, uh, little girl, Maya, is not here this morning. Uh, uh, Maya is not as sick, but uh, Jennifer is, uh, is pretty sick and dealing with uh, <coughs> cold or whatever this is. And plus being eight months pregnant on top of that, that kind of complicates things a little bit more than normal. Uh, so please excuse my voice. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 27 this morning as we look at the Apostle Paul along with Luke sailing towards Rome. Christ told them that they had to appear, that Paul had to appear before Caesar. This is the journey that they would take to get to the place where he would be able to present the gospel to the very head of the Roman Empire. But it was a voyage full of difficulty. And I want to take from this story some principles by which we can derive spiritually that we can apply to our life. And I've entitled the lesson, How to Survive a Spiritual Shipwreck. How to Survive a Spiritual Shipwreck as we see that Paul and those with him are going to have to survive a physical shipwreck, there are some principles here by which we can survive a spiritual shipwreck as we, on our voyage, face the storms and the difficulties and the tragedies and the dangers of life. Look at verse 9 of Acts chapter 27. It says, Now when much time had been spent... Uh, sailing was now dangerous because the fast was over Paul advised verse 10 men I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss not only to the cargo and ship but also our lives admonishment number one admonishment Paul is giving admonishment to those who are on the ship that there are dangers ahead. This voyage is going to end in disaster. It's going to be a, a loss of lives and of cargo and of ship. So we see that Paul here is giving instructions concerning their voyage. And he sees ahead, so to speak, and sees that they are going to face problems. And spiritually speaking, we had we have admonition from the Lord concerning certain behaviors that will cause us to have problems in our spiritual voyage as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 through 12, you have Paul giving admonition to Christians. He talked about how that the Israelites rebelled against God not long after they left Egyptian bondage. And it says, now these things, verse 6, came, became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after things as they also lusted. Admonition. And that we not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Admonition. Verse 8. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day 23,000 fell. Once again, admonition, warning. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by the serpents, verse 9 and 10. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Again, admonition. Admonishment is being given here. Now look at verse 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Here's the point, verse 12. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. Admonition. And Paul here is giving those on the ship admonishment. That there are dangers ahead. And it's going to cause problems. However, verse 11 and 12 Nevertheless, the centurion, back in Acts chapter 27, verse 11, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. He probably thought, well, Paul is a prisoner 
Paul is one of those Christians. Paul is a tent maker by trade. What does he know about voyaging the seas? And therefore, they ignored the admonition, the admonition that he was giving, and the admonishment was not heeded. Verse 12, because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and northwest and winter there. So they're going to go ahead with the voyage. And we find, in, beginning in verse 13, the problems that come about. The tempestuous head arose, verse 14, called the Euryclidon. And they were running uh, under the shelter of the island of Clauda. And they were having problems keeping the ship together. And they, they knew that they were going to sink. And, and as in any ship situation, the lower down in the water you are, the more danger there is in running aground. So they begin to lighten the load and throw things overboard. <coughs> Verse 17 and, uh, uh, through 19. And so they were having, these, uh, having to do this because of the problems that they were facing. Verse 20. Now neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. They thought this is it. We are going to die. Verse 21 after a long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. They ignored the admonishment. But now Paul is going to give encouragement. Encouragement. Things are looking bad. Things are looking terrible. They're on the voyage and it seems like their life is going to be lost. Paul gave the warnings just like we're given warnings, spiritually speaking, from the word of God. And sometimes we don't listen. We can be hard-headed. And as a result, we face the, these problems, these difficulties uh, of life and, and the storms of life. And sometimes they're not any fault of our own. Sometimes those storms of life come upon us without any fault of our own. However, there's encouragement. Acts chapter 27 and verse 22. Now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. So he says in verse 21, you should have listened to me. You should have listened to the admonishment that I gave you. But now you're facing these storms, these difficulties in life. Let me give you some encouragement. There is not a hopeless situation here as long as there's life. And so Paul here is encouraging them to take heart that no loss of life will happen. Well, how does he know that? Well, an angel of God spoke to him that night. The God to whom he serves, to whom he belongs, the angel of, of God spoke to him and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You're going to be okay you must be brought before Caesar, and indeed, God will grant you everyone on the ship. In other words, no one on the ship is going to die. But notice God didn't take away the storm. God did not take away the storm. The storm was still there, and, and sometimes Christians think that God is going to take away the storms of life when we serve him, and that's not always the case. But he tells us how to survive the storm. How to survive a spiritual shipwreck. And you see the words of confidence in Paul in the word of God. Verse 25, take heart, men, for I believe that it will be, I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. That's faith. That's trust in what God says. 
<clears throat> we, we have many words of encouragement in the word of God. And we should have that same attitude that Paul had. I believe it's going to happen exactly the way God said it's going to happen. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse 12. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. Paul tells Timothy this. For this reason I also suffer these things. Talking about persecution. Nevertheless I am not ashamed. Those are the storms of life. The storm on that voyage of the Christian life. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. I know God will fulfill his promises. We should have an unwavering trust in the written word of God, which is God's power to save. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. It gives us everything we need to survive the voyage. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. Therefore, we have encouragement from the word of God that even though it seems hopeless, it is not. There is encouragement that God will save. However, that saving has to be conditional. We must meet the conditions whereby we are going to be saved and we're going to weather the storms of life. Look at verse 30 back in our text, Acts chapter 27 and verse 30. And as the soldiers were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea, under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow. Verse 31 Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. How many Christians jump ship when the storms of life come upon that voyage? They jump ship, they give up. We know salvation is in Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10. To be in Christ is also to be in his church, which is the body. Read the book of Ephesians. And how many Christians, when the difficulties and the hardships and the, the uh, storms of life come upon them, they jump ship. They leave the church, and when they leave the church, they leave Christ. But Paul says, unless you stay in the ship, you will not be saved. There's where the safety is. That's when we need the ship the most. That's when we need God the most. And a proper relationship with Him is not off the ship. It's on the ship. And too many Christians are trying to live the Christian life solo. And it's impossible. Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. He's giving encouragement further for them to remain on the ship. Look at verse 32. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. They were distressed. They were not eating. And so he says, take nourishment. Nourishment. Admonishment. Encouragement, now nourishment. You've eaten nothing, verse 34. Therefore I urge you to take nourishment. For this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. That means you're not going to die. If you remain on the ship, condition, you remain on the ship, you're not going to die. It doesn't matter how bad the storm is. You're not going to die if you remain on the ship. So you need nourishment. And so, verse 35, And when he had said these things, he took bread, uh, gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broke it, he began to eat. And they all were encouraged and also took food for themselves. You know, sometimes we might neglect our physical bodies when we face those storms of life and we don't eat as we should we eat the wrong things and that can be problems that can cause problems in our 
physical self, but also there's a spiritual application as well. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, when he was being tempted by the devil, you turn these stones into bread. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. We need bread. We need physical food. We need that nourishment to live biologically. But to truly live, live biologically and spiritually, we need the word of God. We need spiritual nourishment. And so he is encouraging in them to eat. And so he sets an example. He gets him some food and he starts to eat. That encourages others to take that nourishment. Over and over again in the Old Testament and the New, we find that God's word is likened unto food for our souls. And when we starve ourselves to death spiritually, we're not going to survive the storms. And studying the Bible once a week, just on Sunday, you're not going to be nourished as you should. Just like we have to eat daily to keep up a healthy uh, life, we need to eat God's Word daily, spiritually speaking, study, make application. Acts 17, 11, be like those noble Bereans that we search the Scriptures daily to see whether those things are so. And God says they're noble for doing that nourishment verses 39 through 44 we see what happens they run aground <clears throat> on the island of Malta and I want you to notice verse 44 the ship broke apart however the latter part of verse 44 says and so it was that all escaped safely to land They didn't die. That was a promise that was given. If you stay in the ship, you'll be saved. Verse 31. And so they met with that condition. And by doing so, when they reached the island and the ship finally broke apart, they all made it safe to land. Why? Because God says this will happen. The promise of God will be accomplished. A great lesson there in us trusting the promises of God. When he promises to take care of us, if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Matthew 6 and verse 33. He is going to take care of us. Every promise will be fulfilled. The question is, are we going to remain on the ship? If we don't, we don't have a promise of salvation. We don't have a promise of being taken care of spiritually. Perhaps there's someone here this morning that is not listening to the admonitions, the encouragement, the nourishment of God's word. You're ignoring God's word and therefore as a result, you're for all practical purposes have jumped ship. You might be here in the assembly, but you're not on the ship. You're not in Christ. And simply being in a church building doesn't mean you're on the ship. You've got to be following His will. To get in the ship, you have to hear the Word of God, believe, confess your faith that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of all your sins and be baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. And the Lord will add you to that ship, the church. Acts 2 and verse 47. If you've done that, you've jumped ship. We can rescue you. God's word will rescue you and bring you back. Repent, confessing your sins. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and sing.